Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this lunchtime. Um, as, as you probably know, I'm Patja Stille, Chair of the Urban Design Group. And as always, today's event is recorded and will be made available on our website. And I'm really pleased to see so many turning up this lunchtime and to talk about this really, really important subject. Um, the Urban Design Group, along with the Center for Urban Design and Mental Health, are delighted to welcome you to the book launch of the book Restorative Cities, Urban Design for Mental Health and Wellbeing, which has been written by Jenny Rowe and Leila McKay. The COVID-19 pandemic has really focused our minds on what has been a rapidly growing focus in urban design and planning on how to shape cities for mental health and well-being. I think during the pandemic, many of us or our friends and our families might have experienced mental health issues for the first time in their lives, sharpening our focus and understanding. Until now, designers, planners, health professionals, and other practitioners have lacked an evidence-based book that links science with practice. I myself have kind of experienced how difficult it is to translate research into practical applications. Because as designers, we need to be specific. We need to draw specific proposals. But what does that mean if the research is kind of slightly more academic, I guess? So I'm really, really pleased that we have this book, which makes, creates that bridge. Um, restorative Cities brings together the latest evidence and practice for the first time and provides us with a robust scientific basis for this growing multidisciplinary field. The book introduces a new framework that provides clear but flexible principles and guidance at neighborhood and city level. These principles and guidelines are illustrated with examples from around the world, relevant to anyone who's interested in creating a better urban place and is involved in urban design and planning. Today we've come together to celebrate the launch of this book and to hear from the authors, followed by a panel discussion with urban design and well-being experts. So now I'm going to briefly introduce the two authors. Leila McKay is a director of the Center of Urban Design and Mental Health in London. She is a psychiatrist and public health specialist and a co-editor of the publication Urban Mental Health and managing editor of the Journal for Urban Design and Mental Health. She features regularly in a wide range of print and broadcast media from the Financial Times to BBC Question Times and now on the UDG channel. <laughs> really pleased to welcome you. And then there's Jenny Rowe. Jenny Rowe is Professor of Design, Health and Director of the Center for Design and Health in the School of Architecture, University of Virginia. She is an environmental psychologist and former head of landscape architecture for an international landscape architecture practice. She has written extensively on uh, restorative environments, including for the World Health Organization and the Lancet. So now I hand over to the authors to tell us a little bit more about the book. Over to you, Leila and Jenny. Thank you so much, Katya. And uh, on behalf of myself and Jenny, I just want to say uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us to help celebrate this launch. Um, like many people who have written books that have come out during the pandemic, I think we all had a different vision of what sort of a launch we might have had. But, you know, um, it has meant that by doing it in this virtual capacity, people from all over the world have been able to join. So welcome and do say where you're from, because it's delightful to see um, the reach of where people are joining us from. Um, the pandemic, obviously, as Katya alluded to, has not just affected book launch venues. I think it's really underlined the importance of public space for health, whether that's been strategies that reduce the risk of catching the infection, or whether it's changes that enable people to socially connect in the new context. 
I think most of us have witnessed temporary pop-ups and adaptations to the built environment, whether, you know, wider pedestrian paths or uh, cycle lanes, more park infrastructure. Uh, if there's a silver lining to COVID-19, it might well be the cultural shift that is now taking place in how people are talking and thinking about mental health, how they're prioritising and recognising the importance of mental health and the solutions that um, they're starting to seek. Next slide, please. I'm sure that many people in this audience have at least a passing understanding of mental health, but before we uh, get into the detail of the urban design and planning, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page regarding definitions. So according to the World Health Organization, mental health it's a state where people realize their own potential. They can cope with the normal stresses of everyday life. They can work productively and fruitfully and are able to make a contribution to their community. Now, people who have developmental disorders usually experience a combination of problems with thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and relationships with other people. They then experience symptoms that can cause distress or can impair personal function uh, to the extent to which people might not be able to meet that definition of mental health that I just gave you. So types of mental disorders that you'll be aware of include things like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, dementia, ADHD, schizophrenia. Uh, there's a very long list, of course, uh, but those are some of, the, some of the common conditions. And promoting mental health and supporting people who have mental disorders, it's not just about medication or therapy. That plays an incredibly important role, of course it does, and having access to good mental health care and ensuring that cities are able to provide that for people who need it is clearly essential. But there is more. A wider public health approach for mental health includes a really important role for the built environment and that is a role that is not being fully leveraged. So far, lots of urban design strategies for healthy cities have been largely driven by physical health considerations, like how do you increase exercise to reduce obesity, for example. Restorative cities is going to be driving a change in city design that we've been feeling for a while in the direction of what we actually do to support and promote mental health. Next slide, please. So here's the restorative cities framework. It's a new concept that rigorously looks at how to place mental health, wellness and quality of life at the forefront of city design and planning. It's made up, as you can see, of seven pillars, which are illustrated here, and they're set out in detail in the book. The key point of this book, as Katya said, is that it is very evidence based. It is built off of scientific evidence and thousands of studies in restorative environment science, drawing from psychiatry, geography, architecture, design, planning, public health, engineering, all sorts of different disciplines, bringing those together to show how certain settings can foster recovery from mental fatigue, depression, stress, anxiety, and all those other uh, mental disorders that we have previously mentioned. And what's really important about this book is translating that scientific knowledge into how planners and designers can actually use it to design cities that better support mental health and well-being. Next slide, please. So the first restorative attribute, and probably that with the biggest body of scientific evidence behind it, is exposure to natural green environments. Mm -hmm. The research tells us it can reduce depression and stress, it can improve brain function and help manage symptom severity of anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, ADHD and dementia. And it can also reduce heat stress and improve sleep quality, both of which can promote better mental health. The impact of green space on mental health is widely recognised, but there have been all these questions and there continue to be about how best to modify and maximize and optimize green space so that it has the best impact on mental health. So we explore the amount, accessibility, the type, the views of nature, the quality, the management, the biodiversity, 
the dose of nature that you might get in, in an average day. Uh, this research is um, growing rapidly and we're at a really interesting stage, I think, at the moment. And certainly COVID-19 has shed some light on the inequalities in people's access to green space and the experiences that they have when they're there. And we desperately need more investment in that, particularly in poorer communities, um, for children, for young people, for older people. Uh, some, of, some of those groups are those that can actually benefit most from the mental health impacts of green space. Next slide, please. This is just a little extract from the Green City chapter of the Restorative Cities book. Uh, every chapter has the same format. It sets out the mechanisms about how a restorative attribute delivers the benefits to mental health. Then we explain what those benefits are. And then we move on to uh, design guidelines at a neighbourhood and a city scale. This book is not a rule book. Nobody wants a rule book. It's not not necessarily useful. What this is, is a set of really quite flexible guidelines that can be interpreted as appropriate at the local level, um, as per all the various different disciplines who may find this helpful. I'm now going to pass over to Jenny Rowe, uh, my co-author, who will take you through the rest of the pillars of the restorative cities. Thank you, Leila. Um, so the second attribute is the blue city, possibly the most restorative aspect or attribute of any city is access to and contact with urban water, what we call blue space. The mental health benefits are much the same as for green space, um, slightly less well evidenced, although the evidence is growing. So what's so special about urban water? Well, it's that increased opportunity for fascination, curiosity and wonder, the opportunity to touch and play and interact with water the patterns it makes as it falls over different surface textures and how it interacts with the light. It's a dynamic attribute and that makes it most restorative. But critical is maintenance of urban water. It comes with cost. It needs to be clean, it needs to be safe and it needs to be um, accessed equitably. The third attribute in our model is a sensory city. Um, so scientific evidence is also demonstrating how our senses can be harnessed within urban design to exert positive impacts on our mental health. So some of the multi-sensory attributes of um, the city that impact mental health include uh, reducing unpleasant noise and designing positive soundscapes and sonic refuges in the city, bird sanctuaries, for instance, or kinetic sculpture that interacts with the wind. It's about increasing opportunities for access, not just to healthy food, but also to positive auras and smells that can harness a feeling of belonging and a place identity. It's about increasing visual complexity, uh, which may hold one key to reducing depression and suicide. This slide shows an interactive lighting design for a bridge in Londonderry in Northern Ireland the light can be manipulated through your smartphone. Now that increases cognitive engagement. It causes an aesthetic distraction in the mind and it is significantly reducing suicide from this bridge. The fourth attribute is the neighborly city. Um, here we're building off a heritage from Jane Jacobs, Jan Gell and others who have promoted places for people and how urban design can be, um, how we can design our cities to build conviviality and strong social networks. So some of those attributes we talk about in the book include streets and street corners. All of us know how much um, the local street has risen uh, in importance during COVID for our daily dose of city life. Bumping places, impromptu encounters we might have, at the market, the coffee shop, the dog park. Um, mixed housing is, is part of this um, chapter and how that can be designed to contribute to conviviality and belonging and how that needs to be for all ages, mixed incomes and ethnicities. And then parks and community gardens, um, there's strong evidence emerging to show how access to those attributes 
are facilitating social interaction, pro-sociality, and also empathy, and possibly a key to bridging divides and um, polarization in our cities. Here we have uh, the superblock in Barcelona. Um, the fifth attribute of, of for the restorative city model is the active city. An active city integrates physical activity into our everyday urban life and enables mobility for all citizens. And physical health is interrelated to mental and social well-being, and that's what we set out in the book. Some of those benefits to mental health of being active in the city. And the characteristics of a city associated with that, again, this is the Barcelona Superblock model, include mixed use communities. This is a strong theme in the book, mixed use, mixed age. Um, and this shows a multimodal or what's called a comfortable street, streets that are designed for cycling, for walking, skateboarding, scooters, um, and also have a strong sense of street connectivity. They are linked to other blocks. And again, we see here street trees and urban greening, um, which are linked to the physical um, activity um, attributes of the city. The playable city, I think it's fair to say the benefits of the child-friendly city have received quite a lot of attention, super important. In the book, we're arguing for an all-age approach to the playable city. All of us across all ages and all capacities benefit from interacting with the city in a playful way. And in the book, we separate uh, or distinguish between two main characteristics of play. Pure play context, props and context designed specifically for play. Uh, for playgrounds, play streets, play trails. The important thing about that is that they are connected. And then other playable contexts in our cities, not necessarily designed for play, but which allow playful activities to take place, such as interactive art exhibits. Here we have the cloud in Chicago. Um, opportunities for play appropriation, activities like parkour, and also urban health games where our young people can be engaged and physically active and engaged with play in the city through their phones and smart technologies. The final attribute of the restorative city, arguably its most important attribute, is the inclusive city. Uh, we interpret inclusive design for, as design for everyone, for all ages, all genders, all races, all sexual orientations, all socio socioeconomic strata, and for the full diversity of physical, sensory, and cognitive abilities and needs. Unfortunately, we also know urban design has contributed to segregation, exclusion, and prejudice in our cities affecting people's self-esteem, their dignity, independence, and mental health, as well as their ability to access the full range of a city's educational, economic, social, and cultural health opportunities. So two ways in which we can address more inclusivity are by attracting people again to those mixed income, mixed age neighborhoods. The Barcelona Superblock is a really good model of that. And by making urban design decisions that recognize the needs and characteristics of all residents. Finally, um, I'm just going to flag the theoretical framework for the book, which is derived from restorative environment theory. Uh, like as mentioned, the book is backed up by thousands of studies evidencing some of these attributes. And restorative environments speak to four psychological processes. There's a sense of fascination and wonder and curiosity. There's a sense of compatibility. We need the city to have a good fit with everybody's needs. The restorative city speaks to a sense of being away, a sense of escape from our everyday, and a sense of extent, looking up and out of the horizon, out of our context, a sense of vastness to another world, but also to connections to other people. And we're often asked what simple strategy as a community or an urban designer or a public health practitioner can employ to make a difference to mental health. And this framework, um, the reason why I'm showing this framework is because this, these aspects are important. If you could just do two things in a neighborhood of mental health, 
Our recommendations would be one, to increase its sense of curiosity and fascination. That can be done using nature and access to green space and water, but it can also be done using artificial materials through paint, through lighting, um, and through um, what we call fine grain detailing on shop facades, building in that sense of curiosity and wonder to the city. And secondly, to increase the opportunities for being away and to escape our everyday stresses. And for further strategies on what to do, uh, we'd urge you to look at the book. Um, here's some information on how to order it and some of the disco codes you can apply around the world um, in order to achieve a 35% discount. And that's all from us at the moment. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll hand it back to yeah. Katya. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Laila, for giving us an overview. Um, I think particularly your last point kind of really makes an impression because I think too often in our day-to-day -day practice, we think about the function of spaces and buildings and forget about the wonder and the delight that anybody should feel. And we all experience it walking through a new area or our own neighborhood and, you know, the heart lifts a bit. And I think in a lot of older places, these have happened by, by accidents, kind of quirky things that happened. And I think sometimes we maybe try to be too efficient and too focused on what we deliver and the accidents don't happen that later delight people and allow for that wonder and curiosity. Um, so now we come to our panel and that is made up of Professor Rana Corcoran from the Institute of Population Health, sorry, Institute of Population Health at the University of Liverpool. And um, she's also research director of Pro Social Place. Then we have Graham Marshall, who's a practice director of Pro Social Place and honorary research fellow at the Institution of Population Health at the University of Liverpool. And last but not least, Rachel Toms from Public Health England. She is the housing and health manager. So we start off with Brianna and then Graham and Rachel, and then we come to the Q&A at the end. Thanks, Katia, for the introduction and particular thanks, of course, to Jenny and to Layla for writing this book and for getting it out there and for bringing together the evidence base um, around this really important topic area. Um, I, I wanted really to draw out, I think, three, three points um, in the brief sort of uh, opportunity that I have to discuss this. And the first of those really is a plea for better quality and appropriately directed research and evaluation. Now, um, Jenny and Layla were very sensible in their approach to how they um, uh, reviewed the literature, relying on systematic reviews of the evidence, which is always a, a very sensible thing to do. But I know over the last six years where I've been leading a team um, looking at uh, community well-being and the role that places play in, in our well-being, that actually the evidence base in this area is generally of pretty poor quality, uh, to be honest. And so I think that really we need to uh, build up the base of evidence in terms of quality, but also in terms of attracting a wider source of people interested in researching this area. And I noticed somebody on chat saying that they just started a PhD um, in, in this particular area. And it's really good to see that this area of, of well-being and mental health in cities is attracting um, um, a talented young researchers to it. So uh, I, I, I guess my plea is for researchers of the best quality, because this is an extremely challenging area to research well. It's an applied uh, uh, setting for research in a <coughs> complex area of the city, which is a living, breathing, complex thing, full of human beings, full of different kinds of attributes whose interactions are incredibly complicated. And so researchers need to be at their best um, in order to be able to deal with this using the most robust, the most creative methodologies they can think of. And really importantly, maintaining their objectivity as they begin to question 
the mechanisms and the determinants of mental health and well-being in our cities. And as Katia was mentioning, I think in her introduction, one of the really important skills that researchers need in this area is to be able to translate from academia into practice. That's absolutely essential that we learn to do that better. Probably even more important than research is uh, our approach to evaluating any interventions that happen in places, that happen in our cities, for example. Um, we've not been so good at this, uh, I think, in the past, but um, with, with Leila's and Jenny's book, hopefully we'll become better. So evaluators of uh, changes that happen in place need to be uh, present right at the beginning of those changes so that they can look at the important aspects of the process. For me, I think when we talk about change in living systems like a, like a city, the process, the how of how we do things is probably even more important than what we do. Um, and so process evaluation right from the start is essential to getting, I think, the right mix of things happening. Um, and we need to become much better at a post-occupancy approach to evaluation so that we can really begin to understand the longer term effects of changes um, on people's mental health and well-being of the things that, 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 that happen in cities. My second point really is to do with how we make the changes to support well-being of our future generations. And there seems to me to be at least three essential ingredients to how we do this thing. The first and probably the most important is the co-production approach. We need to be able to co-produce changes and interventions with people who live in the places, people who know the places the best. In some of the evidence that we reviewed for the What Works Centre, we found um, something that was abjectly missing was any well-being benefits coming from changes in places to place infrastructure when they were imposed top down. The benefits to well-being only happened when there was a genuine co-production with, um, with residents, with people who live there, with neighbours, etc. So that's incredibly important to the how we, we achieve these points. The second point on that is that, you know, cities where we live, our mental health, our well-being, our health in general, these are common concerns for everybody. And what that then means is that everybody needs to be involved in these kinds of processes. So we, we must be willing to work better than we have in the past in a multidisciplinary way and also across sectors so that we avoid slipping into our comfortable silos that have got us into the mess that we're, that, that we're currently in, in terms, certainly in terms of, of declining mental health. And then finally, uh, and, and related to that is we need to be taking a resilient systems thinking approach to this, a public health approach to, to how we deal with these kinds of questions, because our cities are living, breathing, complex, ever-changing, unique things. Um, they won't endure being cast in aspic and they won't endure formulas being imposed upon them. The, the magic of well-being in, in cities exists in the mix of the stuff. And so that systems approach, that's flexible approach to how we think about well-being in cities and human habitats really needs to be developed much better than I think it currently is. And then my final point is on the focus where we attend to these needs. We seem at the minute, I think, to be enraptured with building new, with thinking about new towns, healthy new towns, urban extensions, uh, urban villages, whatever we care to call them. They're about new developments. And actually the real need here, and the stats show this, um, and are emphasised in the um, CMO's report this year, um, that the need is in our disadvantaged areas. So our inner cities and our coastal towns is where we as professionals need to be concentrating our efforts if we're to make a big difference to address mental health inequality and well-being interventions when they're really needed. And those are the points that I wanted to make, Katia, so. Thank you, Rihanna. And you've picked up on already quite a few comments in the chat about inequalities. Um, so I'm sure we come back to that. Um, Graham, over to you now. 
Uh, thank you, Katia. I just so to follow on from um, Rianne's uh, ob observations on um, the, the the science uh, and, and 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 the what we're talking about. I just want to pick up uh, some points on the where we do it um, and a little bit of the how, and then I'll pass on to Rachel to really get get teeth into into the how of uh, of what we do. But I just want to talk briefly for a few minutes about four decades uh, in practice. Uh, and I suppose that the, the most important thing from that is to follow up on Rhiannon's um, plea to the scientists, is a plea to designers to be at our best. Uh, and at this time, we don't necessarily have um, the right policy climate to be doing the best that we can, but that doesn't stop us coming together as a huge community of interest and start to build uh, a solid body of evidence that will actually give us a platform uh, to, our, to our practice. Uh, when I first, um, got, I've always been, since when I first got interested in becoming uh, an urban designer, um, a landscape architect, I've always been, I was probably born into this uh, as an unusual creature, but just wanted to go out into the world and make it a better place uh, and, and to change and, and, and design things. But my interest, was always in human ecology and by the time I got to college that became a, a deep interest in evolutionary psychology that's about how people respond to places and what they are and the key thing there is I've always seen settlements as human habitats I haven't seen them as something urban and abstract from nature it's all the same we are animals that move around what we've done just like the herds going across the African plain we have altered the environment to uh, suit our needs better. But because of our huge cooperative brain, we've been able to pull it together um, to create surpluses so that we can live in this kind of a way. Uh, and then uh, there, there ends the utopia because the reality is that uh, the places we've made up till now, up to the 21st century, have been places of great exploitation of people. A few people have gathered up goods and things and land and people too. Uh, and the reality is that has been extremely unsustainable for a social um, species like ourselves. But as, as, uh, as uh, Leila and Jenny point out in the book, and they, they pick on 2050 as everybody else does, we are going to be so urbanized by 2050. This is the scale of that urbanization that is making us really unsustainable. And we're in a terrible, fragile state now. So that's why we come back to the point of we need to be at our best to address this. Um, part of that, let's just stick to the UK, but I know there are people from around the world, so it, it, it goes on. But in, in the UK, we, we have a, a system of, of place governance here, which is about administration. It's not about stewardship of places. And I think that's one of our major failures. We have statutory planning departments that, are, that have had the hearts ripped out of more the expertise taken out and pared down to the bare minimum. Um, we need to put that expertise back into local authorities and back into individual and unique uh, places where, as Ryan said, we can get co-production, uh, co co-working with, with communities uh, working there. But the big challenge there, and this is a huge challenge, is, um, is building the expertise in understanding existing places and how people respond to them. I don't think that... Um, the evidence is, is good enough yet, but even if it was, I don't think it's embedded enough in the, uh, in, in the um, wider urban design, urban, urban planning uh, disciplines. And I think one of the, um, one of the big issues uh, we have there is that we have a lot of old, let's say, really good 20th century narratives that we are all carrying around with us. And I think it's time to put a lot of that baggage down and to embrace the kind of stuff that uh, Jenny and Layla have tried to bring together for us here as a starting point, to start to build on that platform of real knowledge, but use it to challenge and jump up and down on uh, our, our, old, our old knowledge and just see how robust it is. It, it might be, but we shouldn't be afraid of having, having those, those discourses. Uh, one of the big issues is, um, is that understanding of people's response to places. Uh, we are probably all well-resourced people, and we work around the world in a particular kind of way, and um, we have particular life choices and um, qualities of life. For other people, the people that Rayana talked about in existing places where their lives are thoroughly miserable as a result of the environments that they're living in, they're, they're in a 
In a survival mode, their behaviors are completely different. They're alien to us. We don't understand them. But they're not wrong. They are the right behaviors for those places. They're not very sustainable. They're not very good for them. But those people are the people who we say, why can't they recycle more? Why can't they do this? Why can't they? Why do they drive a car every day? Why don't they understand? The thing is, there's, there's a cycle there. Places shape people, people shape places. And in places where you have a downward spiral, that's where we need to come in as experts, as a catalyst to actually arrest those things and, and reverse that spiral. And I think that's, uh, that's exactly what Jenny and Leila have tried to, tried to do here. But my big challenge is uh, in understanding whole places and, and a challenge I put out is that perhaps we now need to, I don't think we need a new discipline of place design. I think we already have one. Uh, and we also have an idea, and we call it planning, and we call it town planning. But I think it's now time to be thinking about that town planning to be design-led and not administratively led uh, around a, a planning act. So maybe there's a new division or just a new emphasis for the R RTPI to take something forward and some planners move into local authorities. And but the, the point is preparedness. Let's get ourselves prepared as, as designers. Um, Katia, back to you and over to to Rachel. Thank you, Graham. Rachel, go straight ahead. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of kind of brief thoughts from me. And, and what we're all talking about kind of goes back to what Leila said right at the beginning, which is um, converting evidence into mainstream professional practice. And that's really what I'm very interested in. Um, and to do that conversion exercise, to mainstream the guidelines uh, in Leila and Jenny's book, um, it is so, so valuable to have, um, to have books like this um, that we can refer to that are really robust in terms of the evidence base and which present what needs to happen in diagrams and using photos and examples. Um, so I think it's a brilliant uh, achievement. And, and as we know, and, uh, and as per what Graham was saying, we do know we've got a long way to go to use every bit of investment available for shaping and reshaping the urban environment, using that investment to actually deliver the results we want for both physical and um, mental health. Um, and as urbanists, we've all got a job to do here, really, to mainstream the, the principles. And it, it comes down to some uh, very practical activities, I think, like saying it out loud in, in meetings, in professional conversations, making sure that these guidance, this, these guidelines are right there in project briefs, that they're there in bids, um, that we're talking about mental health when um, engaging with communities and doing that um, co-production exercise, that it's right there in design proposals um, and negotiations. And something else that, that we can do as practitioners um, is referring to local public health data. Um, and there's two... Um, Two links that I'm going to put into the chat, actually. Um, so um, Public Health England has um, this fingertips tool, which um, shares a lot of local, regional and national data on people's health across uh, England, obviously. Um, and there's a couple of sections of that tool that are very pertinent here, one on mental health and the other on the built and natural environment. So uh, for colleagues in this country, um, I'd suggest referring to um, that tool um, and uh, maybe similar things exist in other countries um, as well. So I'll paste those in. Those are, those are my brief thoughts. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, while you've been talking, there have been lots and lots of questions. Um, we've got 20 minutes, so hopefully we get through quite a lot of them. Um, I think one question I want to pick up first, and somebody called it the elephant in the room, um, is how do we ensure these principles are implemented? And Grant touched on it already, um, you know, referring back to recent place alliance housing audits, we know that around a fifth of the developments they surveyed was so poor that it shouldn't have really had planning permission. Um, how do we get developers to implement this? Is it a carrot or stick? Can we kind of secure their buy-in? And I mean, I've been recently thinking about the positive impact that, for example, the biodiversity net gain 
um, requirements have had on, on plants. And I keep thinking, can we have something similar for, for health gains? Every development, every application, anything that happens needs to demonstrate how we get net health benefits for the existing and future communities. But then how do we measure that? How do we measure the economic impact of um, health and well-being improvements and link that back into the planning process? I appreciate it's a big question and lots of questions <laughs> rolled into one another. Um, but Jenny, Leila, do you want to come back on that first? Graham has already touched on that in terms of um, building up expertise and funding and local authorities as well. Anything, Rachel or Rihanna, you want to say? Um, I might just briefly kick off and then others who are more expert than me on this particular one may, um, may chip in, of course. But um, when I set up the Centre for Urban Design and Mental Health, a lot of the interviews I did with people to understand this, um, this context and why exactly urban design was not being leveraged more effectively for mental health uh, in many places, I got the same story no matter where, where in the world I asked, which was essentially the client isn't calling for it. The client is not, is not sufficiently prioritizing mental health, thus uh, the designers, the planners, the developers, whoever it may be, are not necessarily uh, implementing what is known about this topic just because it's not in the brief. It's um, it may it may or may not come with additional costs, but if the client is not um, on board with prioritizing those things, then that can be a challenge. I think that's particularly been a challenge because of the siloed approach that exists at the moment. Uh, where you know the people who are thinking about mental health, uh, the people who are thinking about public health, the people who are thinking about designing and planning cities are potentially sitting in, in different places. And um, I think from my perspective, it, it feels that the, the, there's a real need to bring together the, those different silos in, into one uh, in order to address this properly and to understand um, understand why and how to prioritize it uh, and when I say how I guess that an another issue has been that uh, that people have been unclear on actually what what should they be doing in order to take advantage of this and because it wasn't that clear we're not necessarily prioritizing it so from my personal perspective that that's been one of the one of the drivers for developing this book it's um I'll pass over I think Jenny probably has some further yeah, points Jenny, in just to speak to your piece, Katya, about cost-benefit analysis, so important that we start to evaluate um, through robust metrics the, the cost-benefits of designing for mental health. There are some models. It can be done. It's messy research. Any research done out there in the real world is messy, but there are health um, economists who can do this work and who need to be encouraged and funded to do it. Uh, they can often make more money working for, um, you know, pharma pharmaceutical companies. Um, and the other is um, this really great examples in the chat bar of cities like Eindhoven and Vienna who are integrating anthropologists and social scientists into uh, their city departments, city-wide departments to manage, as they spoke about, those silos. There's some really um, interesting models emerging in Europe um, and probably other places. Um, so, yes, that's just my my feedback so far. Uh, Brianna, yeah, just to come in on the point of um, um, using uh, health economists and the metrics that we have to try to evaluate economically the changes to mental health and well-being. We must never forget that these are really, really blunt tools okay uh, when we did some um, economic analysis of um, housing first as an initiative for uh, improving um, the uh, quality of life of the most vulnerable um, by by providing houses it actually didn't stack up economically but it certainly stacked up in terms of the qualitative changes that it made for the people who were who who, uh, who the houses were provided for and so we need to be careful not to be stuck within that way of doing things, I think, 
always remember that tools that we use are extremely blunt and never really truly capture the human experience. We, we need to be very live to that. Can I just add, well, 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 the mic's open then, that um, perhaps it's the metrics we need to actually have a look at as a community of interest and not to be told by government or economists from the outside how we should be doing it. I think we're a very big community. We're a very intelligent, well-trained and experienced one. We need to build a voice and have a strong voice on how we think places should be done and, and not be quite so passive as we maybe have been. Maybe we need to get a manifesto and an agenda together and look to places like New Zealand uh, and their, their, their well-being and Ireland and, uh, and Wales, their well-being metrics that they are uh, applying to how they look after their, uh, their communities and their, their countries. Thank you for that. And I think it kind of links into another question, which, I mean, given that we have, I mean, such a broad international audience today, I think it's a really relevant question, and that is, have you considered any cultural issues regarding the restorative city concept? Um, in other words, do you think what makes a city restorative is generic and universal, or what works in the Western culture works also in other cultures? Um, what's the different, how, how do we relate to that? Any, any thoughts on that from our panel? Well, I'm happy to take a stab at that as a researcher in restorative environment research. Uh, a lot of the evidence has come from the Western world. Um, it's only in the last, let's say, couple of years where some work's been done looking at the concept of green space and, and the benefits of green space, say, in Kenya, in Africa, other places in, in, um, around the world. So we really do need to understand those um, nuances and I have absolutely no doubt those nuances exist um, that people experience the city in different ways based upon their culture but it's a big void in the research currently so we really really need that work done if we're going to really plan ahead with this evidence-based uh, practice um, and, and into design practice. Thank you, Georgia. Also, it's just um, posted that there's lots of research also in Brazil. So, I mean, maybe we can use the chat line as well to identify the different research, um, which we are aware of. That would be good. Can, can I just come in and make a comment in relation to that? So, um, when we when we when we talk about uh, Leila's and Jenny's first pillar of the green city. We are actually taking um, um, uh, a stance around ethnicity, if you like, and around culture, because it, it wouldn't necessarily be true to say that our preference in the Western world for the pastoral landscapes, the greenness, would necessarily be true everywhere else. Um, and so we, we really do need um, some uh, uh, some research around ethnic differences and preferences for landscapes, I think, if we're to properly address these kinds of, of issues. And that, as far as I can tell, is really missing from the literature and it absolutely needs to be done. And if I could just drop, sorry, keep dropping these things in, but I'm drop, just getting uh, thoughts triggered as well. When we talk about um, the value of, uh, of blue infrastructure, of, of water, we have to also remember places like all our seaside towns, which are probably um, the most deprived in, in, in the country, probably in Europe, and they're all next to the coast. There's lots of blue stuff there. So what's going on with that? So is it the blue that's important? Is it the green that's important? Or is there something else we're not understanding that's happening here? And if, we, if I just leave a thought with you, the next time you go out and look at blue and green, the biggest thing you will see is movement. And is it that? Is it something deep within us that's triggered within us when we used to live in a wilder landscape that we're looking out for when we're, when we're foraging and it's those sorts of things? So we can have the blue and we can have the green, but we have it because we understand how we're responding to it and what it is about it, what the qualities uh, of, of, that, of that thing are. And then that gives us something that transcends the world. It's something all humans will respond to in a particular kind of way. It gives us a foundation. And then we can start to layer up the cultural differences over the top of that, which may be the colors and, and, and everything else. So it's not that, that there are different cultures with different landscapes, 
the, 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 it's, it's just understanding our responses to environment, I think, is the, is, the, is the fundamental point I want to make on that. Okay, thank you, Graham. And I think I link this back to another question, which was kind of mostly about the traffic in towns and cities and the question um, whether that basically less traffic is better for our well-being. Um, but I think, in a way, what, what you are saying is that movement might be the thing that is very good, depending on which means of transport we use, for example. And so I think there are different things. There's the traffic, um, the air quality, everything connected to that. And then there's the ability to meet and, and move around freely. Um, are there any comments from the audience on that aspect? Right there. Leila? The traffic plays all sorts of different roles in in um, mental health and well being. Um, one of those, as as you rightly say, is um, prioritizing traffic potentially deprioritizes active transport methods that are more beneficial for physical and mental health. Um, you also rightly note um, the air pollution aspect, which does have mental health impacts. There's also aspects around. Um, around the sounds and smells and all these various sensory aspects of traffic. There's also aspects of thinking about how, set, how um, the infrastructure that allows uh, motor vehicles to move around um, cuts up the, um, the neighborhoods and um, separates people and um, in many ways changes the comfort and um, ambience of, of those neighborhoods. Um, of course, there's um, people who have cars and who do not have cars. And if the cars become a dominant feature, then that has um, inequalities impact as well. There's probably a lot more that are not coming to my mind right now. But I think that uh, there's, a, there's a general feel that, uh, that traffic, um, excessive numbers of, uh, of motor vehicles in, in the public spaces are not necessarily going to be very good for your mental health. That said, nothing's a black and white situation. We need to remember the importance of being able to access opportunities. And uh, if, if if there's no other way, then then you know it's not like traffic is traffic is the villain here. It's really a matter of figuring out how to make cities that work for people. Thank you. Um, another question was that is, and I'm probably going to mispronounce the name. Viturachi um, has asked, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the playable cities concept and what you mean by that? I'm happy to take that. Um, so I think play has been very much explored in the city from the child perspective. Super important. We're not saying that that's not important. What we're saying is that also the city can be designed in such a way to allow people the freedom to, to use the city for other forms of play. So parkour, for instance, or skateboarding, people use sort of the, the, the structures of a city in a very creative way for playable activities. I've talked when I spoke about the importance of what I call urban health games, um, using smartphones um, by which to um, engage our young people in moving about and interacting with the city. Um, looking at the city from a different perspective, that's what the cloud, the example I gave on the slide does. In Chicago, you look at the city, it distorts the city, you see yourself in a different way, you see others in a different way through um, the mirror image on, on that cloud sculpture, so public sculpture. There are so many different ways of engaging people with this idea of creativity and wonder other than just standard play equipment in playgrounds. Um, and Tim Gill has spoken um, and written about how we design a play for a child and teen orientated city. And what we're saying is we want to extend that to include all age play. Um, and, and all of us need to, to be engaged um, and experience a level of wonder in our city environments. Uh, can I pick up on a couple of points there, actually, which I think um, might integrate across these different questions? Um, and it, and it uh, directly picks up on what you were saying about movement, Katya. 
um, which I think is essential here. Okay, so the reason that so, well, one of the reasons that so many cars in our in our cities are problematic is because they they eat into the public realm and they mean that there's very little space to do anything else, essentially, including moving around in different kinds of ways. Um, and, you know, moving around in different kinds of ways helps us to think about active cities and it also helps us to think about playable cities. So one of the most interesting talks I've ever been to in this area was given by a couple of adult skateboarders who, who um, I, I, went, I went to the talk and thought, oh, I'm not, gonna, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm really going to get this or I'm going to get much out of it. But it was fabulous because what it did was, was to show how, you know, getting out and using this form of movement really enabled you to see the city in a different kind of way. Um, the way they talked about the surface of the city and the way you could glide through the city was incredibly eye-opening. And so um, th that's some attempt to bring together a more integrated approach to what Layla and Jenny are calling seven pillars. I mean, personally, I'm not a big fan of codes or pillars or stuff like that. I like to think about how things integrate to create something that actually is, is, is beneficial to the whole human being. And, that, and that's an attempt to to really try to bring it together by using that example. Thank you, Rihanna. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to ask one, one more question. <laughs> um, just, yeah, well, I guess two, two questions linked into one. And I mean, given that we have a really broad audience today, we've got planners, academics, we've got um, practitioners, urban designers, uh, landscape architects, architects on this call, And um, after this, we are all going to go back probably to our day-to-day -day job. And so what or who do we need to um, persuade to, A, create a series of longitudinal studies and, you know, get that research base, which we talked about? Or who do we need to, as a practitioner, convince to actually implement this um, the work, let it be our clients, let it be the planners. If you give us the kind of key persons, you say, well, in the next afternoon, next few days, try and get to those people. And this is what we, where we need to start working. Might be lots of people, but let's start somewhere. <laughs> Anyone? I think that depends on what context and where you are in the world. So in the US, I would say city mayors are a real key to advancing um, urban design strategies. And they do come together. Um, I forget the mechanism by which they come together around the world, but they do have real influence in the states and, and we're beginning to see that in, in, in the UK with Andy Burnham and, and the sort of new mayor of, of, of Yorkshire and those types of initiatives but it needs it needs really strong leadership and from my perspective as a researcher if you're going to have an impact let's say on the chief medical scientist for Scotland or England you need really robust science using a whole host of metrics, subjective metrics, but also physiological metrics to show the benefits of, of these attributes. And, and that does require longitudinal research. Um, and it's, it's few and far between, as we all know. Um, so that's just a couple of comments from me. Yeah, um, thank you. Any other thoughts? Just, just one quick one, which is a, probably a third, third repeat of what I said. We are a huge community of informed interest and we need to come together and something which is probably dear to Robert's heart is the Urban Design Alliance that we both worked on many years ago where the institutes came together around urban design uh, with the purpose of lobbying government with a collective voice. I think it needs to be reinvigorated um, but refocused around this discussion and debate that we're having now so that we have a, a strong voice. I, I know all the institute presidents at the moment have a very strong voice on this. So I think we need to come together in an organized kind of way within the UK uh, to do this. We can't speak for the rest of the world from here, 
that we um, we did kind of invent uh, modern planning and influence the rest of the world. So hopefully, if we we just get get stuff happening here in a huge influential economically uh, influential country that does have a big impact on the unsustainability of the world, we we will do some leading. And I think the the, the a big part of un, of our unsustainable human behavior on the planet isn't about coal mines and things it's about how we live in urban places it's about how we live on the planet and the attitudes that that puts in our minds you know the, the way we live in a town will determine whether or not we want some gladioli this afternoon from kenya where they ought to be growing food for themselves there's a there's a whole set of issues uh, there that are wide but it all starts in towns because those towns influence our behavior we are the town people so we should be we should be doing things and if government can't draw up a manifesto we will draw it up for them and leave it there until the government comes along that does pick it up because we have these huge great big global problems that aren't going to go away and can't be ignored anymore so we need to be prepared to uh, to deal with those um there ends my sermon <laughs> <laughs> thank you any other words otherwise i'm kind of really conscious that um and Sorry to kind of, it's one o'clock, because there's still so many questions in the chat which we haven't had a chance to discuss. And I mean, I think while we were, you know, preparing for this chat, we, we kind of feared that might be the case. Um, I mean, this webinar will certainly go onto the UDG website and will be shared widely. Um, I think as a UDG, it is a subject that is very close to our hearts and we will certainly kind of make sure that we take that forward, the discussion in one form or another and that we will bring in the kind of comments you have made and um, the ideas you have had into the work we are doing and kind of you know, commenting on government proposals such as white papers and etc. So we will certainly pick that up and take it forward and probably continue these discussions as well. Um, so I'm really sorry to have to kind of close this off at this point. Um, please stay connected um, via LinkedIn, via the usual channels, and I'm sure the speakers are available as well for kind of more, more interaction. And so I wish you all a good day and hopefully you enjoyed the webinar.